was out at, uh, had, had the privilege of doing a service out at <coughs> OCCC a number of years ago, and I remember uh, after the service, uh, one of the pretty big gnarly guy came up to me and was kind of thanking me, uh, you know, for being out there and, uh, and uh, sharing the word and had a chance to pray with him. And he, uh, he was just telling me a little bit of his own, uh, his own testimony and how many years he had been in prison so far and how many more years uh, uh, he was going to be there. Uh, and it was a little doubtful whether he would ever leave or not. But he said, you know what? It is, if this is what it took for me to come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's all worth it. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trade my relationship with the Lord for anything. And if I've got to sit here the rest of my days, one day I'll be with the Lord for all eternity. Some very bad things happen to us sometimes, and the Lord can, can use them. That's going to happen with Jacob. And let's just say at the outset, it doesn't have to. I mean, in terms of what this message is all about, Abraham's hip was never crippled. Joseph's hip was never crippled. But uh, Jacob's was. Because he was a hard case. <laughs> and I think that's why some of us can really relate to, uh, to Jacob. But he had reason to be, uh, to be encouraged at this point. Remember last week, he'd come back into the land. Laban had caught up with him. He was very much afraid, thought he might die then. Uh, and God intervenes to Laban, speaks to him in a dream, and basically says, whatever you do, you better not hurt Jacob. They make this covenant together that says, I don't trust you. You don't trust me. So uh, we're going to put a little barrier here. You're not going to cross it this way. I'm not going to cross it that way. But it really becomes known as, remember, Mizpah, the watchtower, where God was going to watch over Jacob. And God was saying to Jacob, you don't have to be able to trust Laban, but you have to be able to trust me. Basically, I got your back is what that says. Now as he comes into the land, wanting to reconcile with Esau, he doesn't have to. It's a big place. He can just go a different direction. He doesn't have to detour, in a sense, to try to find Esau so that he can be reconciled to him. Remember his twin brother that the last time he saw him promised to kill him if he ever saw him again. That's who he's now going to. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we're trying to do the right thing is when it seems like things get worse and it's in those really dark times that we actually really get tested. It's like we sometimes we maybe have this image that, you know, if we're being obedient to God and we're doing what God wants us to be, everything's just going to kind of work out. Uh, and sometimes it does. And sometimes it's in those times it gets worse and God begins to test us because, well, he wanted something more in the relationship with Jacob uh, as he does with our own lives. This thing is so, uh, so practical. I hope it'll minister to you. Let's look at Jacob preparing to meet Esau in the first eight verses. So Jacob went his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of the place Mahadnaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban, stayed there until now. I have oxen and donkeys, flocks male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also was coming to meet you, and 400 men are with them. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him, and the fox and the herds and the camels into two companies. And he said, If Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. So First thing we note is the preparation uh, is the idea that he is uh, met by the angels, and so he calls the place two camps, Mahat Naim. Uh, Twenty years later, he had left, remember, and uh, spends that night in Bethel with his head on a stone pillow and has the vision of angels ascending and descending on that ladder. God saying, I'm with you, I'm going with you, I will bring you back again. It represented God's presence uh, it also represented uh, uh, the entry place of uh, he's saying, I'm always going to be here with you and I'm always going to be for you. Now he comes back into the land. The land of Canaan would be known later as the land of Israel. And we're going to get to that name in this text and what it really means. But uh, he had to be pretty excited. And this is the idea when he says it's, it's a, quote, joyful declaration. Uh, but at the same time, he still has the 
overriding concern of how is it going to go as he tries to reconcile himself uh, with his brother. You know, we've still got the same promise to us in Psalm 34, 5. It says, the angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. And, uh, and so this had to be significant, meaningful to him. He was probably feeling a lot better about what he was doing, where he was going, and that the Lord was with him. Now, the second thing about the preparation is he arrives and he sends word to Esau. He sends uh, someone out to let Esau know that he's coming, uh, that he wants to see him, again, wants to reconcile with him and so forth. And notice the terminology he uses. He refers to Esau. He's saying, you say this to him. Call him my Lord. You say that I am his servant. Uh, and mention all of the, the wealth. Mention the donkeys and the animals. Remember, when he went uh, and fled, uh, he had nothing. And when he, uh, when he arrives in uh, Padan Aram, now he's, uh, he's uh, returning uh, very, very blessed, at least materially. And then the third thing about the preparation, it becomes fearful. Why? Because of the news of, well, there's a little army headed that way. 400 men was the typical militia of the day. It's not like Esau's coming and he's bringing the wife and the kids. <laughs> and they're like, oh, all right, praise the Lord. It's like, uh, no, Jacob, uh, uh, he's coming, the guy that wants to kill you, and he's bringing 400 armed men with him. You know, it's, it just was kind of what, what, wasn't what he was hoping for as he thought about this uh, reconciliation. Notice verse 7, so Jacob was greatly afraid uh, and, and distressed, <clears throat> no longer thinking about the angels, apparently no longer thinking about the promises of God, and that happens sometimes, doesn't it? doing the right thing, going the right way, trying to do what God would want us to do. And we get this little bit of news and it's like, okay, forget what, <laughs> what God said and God's promises. And, and, uh, and we're just kind of wrapped up in fear. Uh, now, notice how does he respond to the fear? Well, in a good way. Verses 9 to 12, he begins to pray. Our first recorded prayer of Jacob, not that he hadn't prayed up to this point, but this is the first time we have it recorded in Scripture. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children notice that no i think you've got more than one mother there jacob it kind of skips that part the mother with the children for you said i will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude so uh, jacob we first say praise with humility which is a very good thing we're saying i'm not worthy the least of all your mercies that's a good way to start in our prayers because none of us are are worthy are we we always pray based on god's mercies to us we pray for somebody that uh, is sick. Lord, we pray, Lord, none of us deserve to be healed by you, you know, but we pray in your mercy that you might do this. Lord, I pray that you might, that's a good way to come to the Lord. It always should be uh, in humility. And, uh, and that's what he does here. That's, that's a good thing. Notice, secondly, he, he does a very good thing as well. In a sense, he's quoting scripture. What he's doing in verse 12, uh, he's remembering the promises of God uh, to him. And uh, his opening and concluding references to God's promises are, you know, great statements of, uh, of faith. And that's a good thing to do as well. I think, again, the more we know of Scripture, the, the, uh, the more appropriately we can pray sometimes. Is it because God is very forgetful and we need to remind him of his promises? No, it says, I'm alone with God. I'm praying to him. I need to remind me <laughs> of his promises uh, because after all, prayer is never designed to get me to be able to change God's mind. Prayer is designed for God to be able to get to me and change my mind or my attitude and, uh, and my outlook on, on life. And remembering the promises of God, repeating those promises of God to God in prayer, well, that's a, that's a good thing. Lord, I'm praying for my neighbor down the street. Lord, and your will says, it is not your will that any should perish, but all should come to salvation. Lord, your word says that when we pray your will, you hear us. 
And if you hear us, we have what we've asked of you. Lord, so I pray for my neighbor down the street. You don't have to memorize the scriptures, but it's, it's a good thing to know God's word. And it helps us formulate our prayers. It helps us pray in faith because after all, God said it. It's his promise. And I'm kind of, kind of uh, you know, in a sense, bringing that into my prayer life to help strengthen what I'm actually asking of him so that I can really believe and really trust him. Now, the commentaries, I have to tell you, kind of split over what Jacob's doing here. There are some that saying that's exactly what he's doing, and this is awesome. And there's others that are going, I don't know, Jacob could still be being Jacob here. <laughs> yeah, he's remembering the promises, but is he really trusting in the Lord? Is that what he's doing here? Why does he divide them up in two companies? And why does he go into this whole thing next, or this whole procession that we're about ready to see? He's prayed, is it settled? Is he trusting the Lord? Well, maybe, but not exactly. Again, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. We're not really sure if that's what Jacob is doing here. Lean not on your own understanding. Well, we're going to see that actually he is still kind of leaning on his own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In many ways, he's done that, and he shall direct your paths. That's what uh, Jacob is hoping to happen. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, we want to be able to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And it is a struggle, isn't it, at times, to not lean on our own understanding? Uh, and so I think we can relate to Jacob. He's trying to do the right thing. He's preparing to meet Esau to be reconciled. He's praying uh, in, in response to the fact that, oh, by the way, he may and his whole family be slaughtered very soon. That would kind of uh, prompt you to pray, I think, a little bit if you had a relationship with the Lord. Uh, and it is here with Jacob. But notice what he does next in verse 13 to 21. He sends a procession of head of him, verse 13. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother, 200 female goats and 20 male goats and 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass over before me, put some distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first saying, when Esau, my brother, meet you and ask of you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, they are your servant, Jacob's. It's a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, he is also behind us. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterwards I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went on over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. So he, well, he prayed, but then he kind of comes up with this idea. Again, uh, some people would look at this and go, well, this is, this is kind of a smart thing here. You know, he, he is trying to, you know, he's trying to appease his brother. He's trying to soften him a little bit. And Casey really is coming with all these guys, which looks like he is, to maybe kill them. And uh, maybe this will work, but again, not exactly trusting the Lord with all of his heart at this point. But notice the procession itself starts with the, uh, the animals, 550 animals arranged in five groups of goats, sheep, camels, and later the cattle and the donkeys. Uh, it was a gift fit for a king, uh, even in that day. This was, this was sizable. It, it was a fair amount of wealth that he was giving away at this point. So we know that Jacob is generous especially when his life is on the line. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, he's hoping it's going to have a, a great impact. Notice what he does also in the procession. He uh, sends some definite instructions. Uh, verse 18, uh, then you'll say, they are your servants, Jacob's. It's a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, he's also behind us. 220 goats arrive and they hear the concluding words and he is behind us. 220 sheep and rams arrive uh, and they hear again, uh, this is a gift for you, and he's uh, behind us. These all belong to, to Jacob, but it's a gift for my Lord Esau. Uh, it's, so, someone said this is the first time in Jacob's life he wanted to be last. <laughs> and uh, again, as we, 
kind of emphasized there as I read at verse 28, I will appease him with the present that goes uh, before me. But what happened to that prophecy given to his, uh, his mother, Rebecca, back in, uh, in Genesis 25, 23? As she's pregnant and these two boys are fighting within her womb, and she's saying, what is happening to me? Which probably a few pregnant women have said over the years. Uh, and then the Lord speaks to her in verse 23, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall kill the younger. Actually, it doesn't say that. It says the older will actually serve the younger. Did Jacob know that? Of course, he's known it. He's known it his entire life. But he's just kind of had a hard time believing God's word right now. Why? He's bound up in fear. This doesn't look too good. Circumstances are really turned for the worse. He's trying to do the right thing. I mean, the angels are there. What is up with this? Why isn't he coming and we're having a luau? Um, this could be a big family reunion. Why is he bringing a little militia out to meet me? Where's God in the midst of all of this? I mean, I'm praying. i am kind of got some promises going. I'm trying to be as humble as I possibly can. Jacob, too bad he couldn't be more like us. We were just so trusting of God and never <laughs> fall in these kinds of things. But it's good to try, you know, study these guys and see their folly and so forth. No, actually, I think we all can relate to this. And uh, it's interesting that the, uh, the, the little stream, it's more than just a little stream. It's fairly sizable. Jabak means emptying. And that's exactly what needs to happen to, uh, to Jacob. Trying to prepare to meet Esau. He prays. He sends this procession. Well... Here's the good part, verse 22 to 32. We'd say he does not prevail, and therefore he's blessed by God. How many of you know that if you have a fight with God, you're better off losing? <laughs> you know, you don't want to win with God because that means you just walked away. You really want to lose uh, so that he then can bless you. Verse 22, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with them, and he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you've struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. My life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. The first thing that is important to note is what Jacob does, and uh, we don't really know what prompted it, but he gets alone. And it wasn't an easy thing to do. It wasn't a convenient thing to do. It was already night, and this is, a pretty, this is a pretty heavy duty stream that we're talking about, and it would have been somewhat dangerous to cross at night. He crosses it with all of his wives and all of his kids and everything else and gets them on the other side, and then he crosses it to get back to the other side. Um, again, what prompted him to do that, we don't really know, but we certainly do note that this is exactly what you need to do in this situation, which is to get alone with God. You're faced with a big decision. Things are not going your way. Circumstances look like, well, I, don't, I just don't know if I even see God in this or can believe his promises to me. It's a good time to get alone with, with the Lord and let him reassure you and let him speak. Instead of our first resort or our resource, excuse me, it's often our last resort. Again, it should be the first thing we do instead of the last thing we do. And some people don't do it at all. There are some Christians that don't do it at all. They never get alone with God. They never struggle with God over issues in their lives. Uh, but it's important that we do. It should be the first thing that we do. And we'll see why as we go through this. Well, we want to see that Jacob was uh, hoping to prevail against his unknown assailant. So... He finally gets uh, back across the, rip, the river 
uh, perhaps still half of him dripping wet, in the dark, out of nowhere, a hand grabs him, yanks him to the ground, and a wrestling match ensues that goes for six or seven hours. No dialogue, nobody says a thing, just uh, a, a wrestling. I don't know if you've, uh, you know, uh, wrestling, I mean, just to, uh, if, if you've ever had to do it, high school PE or anything, it's exhausting. You ever watch a, even a college wrestling or high school wrestling match, it's minutes. <laughs> it goes very quickly, it's exhausting. And uh, Jacob was a tough guy. He goes for hours. It's like God is trying to wear him down and he will not surrender. He will not give up. And uh, the daylight is breaking. And, uh, and of course, while this is all going on, as I said, there's no dialogue. It doesn't happen until later. We know from other texts like Hosea 12.4, and we'll read that passage here in, in a little bit. But uh, there, again, the Bible is a very good commentary on the Bible. And it says he strove with God. He was wrestling with God. And he says so himself. As he says, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. I just want to say that he didn't see God face to face. He may have thought he did. But what he saw was what we would call a Christophany. Here's God condescending to take on human flesh and wrestles with him. He doesn't really see God in, in all of his glory because we know later, Moses, the same writer, no man can see the face of God and survive. But at the same time, we know that from Abraham back earlier in Genesis, as God is contemplating the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he arrives at Abraham's tent, you remember to say that a year from now, hey, that promised child Isaac will finally be born. God shows up as a man. Remember when two other men that turn out to be the angels that go on into the city and they take on that appearance. And that's what we have with the, with the Lord here. That's why Jacob later calls the place Peniel, where he says, I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Well, in a way he did, uh, but it wasn't God in his glory. It's what uh, we would say in terms of those that saw Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, John 14, 9. And Paul mentions this idea, very interesting, of what it is to see God's face. How do we see it? Well, he says it's in the face of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. He's the creator. And who has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's how we see the glory of God. It's in the face of Jesus Christ. So he wrestles with an unknown assailant, turns out to be God himself. He doesn't prevail, which turns out to be a good thing. And of course, he's crippled in the process. Verse 25, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And basically at that point, well, he's pretty much like a, a limp doll. And uh, uh, if you've uh, ever, ever seen any... Um, anybody's uh, shoulder be popped out. A lot of times in, uh, in the mixed martial arts and some of the other stuff, they, uh, they do an arm bar, and if the guy doesn't tap out, they, they just pop that uh, shoulder right out of joint. That match is pretty much over right there, and uh, it's, uh, it's all done. Josh had that happen. My son Josh had that happen to him just in training in uh, unarmed combat to hit the end. He's a big guy, so he had to wrestle the guy that was the biggest guy, which outweighed him by about 30 pounds, and Looked like he worked out like uh, he did. And uh, yeah, he got him in that, that hold and he was trying to get out of it and pop, popped it right out. That end of the match right there. Well, you can imagine your hip being popped out. Uh, that's, that's a whole different thing. This had to be incredibly painful. We'll read in Jose in a minute that it was with tears <laughs> that Jacob is saying, uh, will, you, will, you, will you please bless me? <laughs> uh, that's the idea. He's, he's not the victor here. He, uh, you know, again, it's the, uh, you, you don't ask your subordinate to bless you. You ask the superior to, to bless you. Uh, Jacob is crippled at this point, And that's what it took for this guy that was so hard-headed before he would finally surrender. Uh, the other thing about uh, his not prevailing is, again, the obvious. So he would receive, as we said, a blessing, but also a new name. 
And uh, as I mentioned, Hosea gives us a pretty interesting commentary on this whole whole thing, and uh, I want to read that to you, but it, it needs a little setting up. Hosea is, again, uh, a prophet, and he's prophesying uh, at a time when the northern kingdom still exists and has not been taken into the Syrian captivity. Uh, and yet uh, they, remember, under King Solomon, the son of David, uh, his son Rehoboam reigns. He takes the advice of the young guys and not the old guys and increases all the taxes upon the people, and a lot of them went, okay, uh, we're going to move to a state where there's no state taxes. No, they, but they basically, they say, we're out of here. Uh, and they divide and form the northern kingdom of those uh, 10 tribes up there that become known as Israel itself. And the south becomes known as Judah, even though there's more than one than Judah in the south. But the other name they're known as that you have to know to understand Hosea is they're also known as Ephraim, which was one of the tribes in the north. And you remember that Jeroboam, who led them up there, uh, was afraid that at uh, the uh, three feast days, when they would migrate back, all Jewish males were required to make at least those three feasts every year. They'd go to Jerusalem. They'd get to Jerusalem, see the glory of the temple and so forth, and say, maybe we made a little mistake. We were too hasty in this rebellion and separating ourselves. So to prevent that from happening, he builds two temples, one in the north at Dan, one in the south at, well, our familiar place where Jacob slept that night in Bethel. And they worshiped a calf god there. Again, as we remember all the way back to the calf god of uh, coming out of uh, Egypt. And, uh, and they have that worship going on there. And uh, here Hosea, sometime later, is crying out to the people like the prophets did to repent and come back to God. And he's going to speak about the northern kingdoms of Ephraim and Judah as the southern kingdoms. And he's going to make reference to the study we're doing here this morning, this episode in the life of Jacob. So here we go, verse 1, chapter 12 of Hosea. Ephraim, the northern kingdom, feeds on the wind, pursues the east wind, and daily increases lies and desolation. Also, they make a covenant with Assyrian, a foreign government, thinking that will help them. And oil is carried to, uh, to Egypt, hoping that will help them. The Lord also brings a charge against Judah, the rest of the tribes in the south, and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him, the nations, and their sin. He took his brother by the heel. That's what Jacob did, right? He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. That is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorable name. So you, by the help of your God, return, observe mercy and justice, and wait on your God continually. So Hosea is saying to all of the Jews, all of Israel, the ones in the north and the ones in the south, you need to turn and repent and come back to God. How are you to do that? The way that Jacob did it. How did Jacob do it? He got alone with God. He struggled with God in tears with God. And eventually he surrendered to God. And he chose that he was going to trust God no matter what happened. Therefore, he's going to be called Israel at this point. And Hosea said, and that's what we need to do. We need to get our nation right before God. We need to, as the people of God, get alone with God and struggle through some issues in our life until we hear from God and God brings his blessing back to our lives. So there's, there's God's commentary on what we've, uh, we've just read. Notice that the conversation as it begins in verse 26 uh, there it says, let me go, Jacob says, uh, or the, uh, the man who really is uh, Christophany, uh, Jesus Christ, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And, uh, and so it's very interesting. So then uh, the Lord says to him, what's your name? Because again, in those days, the name was very important. It was your identity. It was your character. It was who you, who you were. You know, we've talked about that before. We, uh, you know, na naming kids today is, uh, you know, kind of sometimes um, 
sometimes very thoughtful, and a lot of people really pray over it and think of it. It's, you know, they want it to be a family name and so forth. They want it to be something passed down. They want it to be something, uh, you know, significant, sometimes something from Scripture or a person in Scripture that's significant uh, in everything, and, uh, and that's good. And sometimes <laughs> it's, uh, it's just uh, after a famous basketball player or something. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, kind, of, it's kind of random sometimes, uh, and, uh, and that's okay. But, but it was very, a very big deal uh, in this, uh, this particular culture here. So when the Lord says, what's your name? Sir Planter. I grabbed my brother's heel. And he says, yes, you did. You've been wrestling with God and men for a long time. You wrestled with your brother. You wrestled with your father. You wrestled with your father-in-law. And you're wrestling with me now. And so he pulls that hip out of joint, a permanent mark on his life. Verse 32 then says, to this day, the children of Israel, the Jewish people to this day, don't eat the, uh, the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip. Why? Well, because they consider this event to be very sacred. It's, when, it's where they get their name, Israel. The Talmud says, it was a sacred moment when we learned we can't trust ourselves. We must trust God. And, and we kind of look at the little dietary thing. And, well, that's kind of weird. What's up with that? No, they said this was it. This was the turning point. Certainly the turning point in Jacob's life, but it's the lesson that we're supposed to remember through all generations in this way uh, and also because of the, uh, the name. One writer said the new name cannot be separated from the crippling, for the crippling is the substance of, uh, of the name. Uh, again, very very interesting in terms of the, the new name, this idea of Israel coming to him. Uh, sometimes we say, uh, what does Israel mean? And, and, and I have said often, because it is kind of a general term, it means governed by God, and that's true. Uh, Jacob at this point is going to be governed by God. Uh, it, it's not exactly uh, at the essence of what's going on here, certainly. Uh, there are some writers, non-Jewish writers, that would say it means the prince of God. Uh, well, that kind of misses the point. Literally, it means God's fighter. Because here's a guy that fought with God and that struggled with, with God. Uh, one writer said, The day of failure through power was over, and the day of success through weakness uh, had begun. Uh, the nation of Israel, what was to mean? It was a people who had surrendered themselves completely to God. And because they had surrendered themselves completely to God, now they could move on forward with God and the plans he had for their lives. You, obviously, it didn't always mean that to everybody. That's why Paul in the New Testament, in Romans, he says, not everyone who is of Israel is Israel. Not everybody's completely surrendered to God. Some of them got the name, but they're not surrendered. We could say that among Christians as well. Some of them have the name, Christ's followers. Are they really surrendered? And this, this is what's so important about this. The whole nation remembers it in a dietary no, uh, note here and by the name that they're, that they're given. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's because we surrender. But we also need to surrender a lot, a lot of other things along the way, don't we? I mean, there's the, I don't care how long you walk with the Lord, there's going to be continual times when you need to get alone with the Lord. If there's something you're struggling with God over, great, get alone with them and struggle through it. Your attitude towards your boss, your job, whatever is going on that you know is not right in your own heart. That was one of the great things about the men's retreat. There was a lot of guys on an invitation by Pastor Bill on Friday night that went forward and said, I surrender this thing, whatever it is, this thing that's going on in my life. It's a continual process. That's what we do, isn't it? I, I got an issue going on, and the way I settle it is by getting along with God and struggling, whatever, giving Him, I can quote all, I can be as humble as I want, quote, quote all the promises I got. But in the end, He'll just kind of let me go on and on until I say, and by the way, yeah, your way's probably better. So not my will be done, but thy will be done. And I'm not really sure how this is all going to work out. As far as Jacob knows, his brother's still going to come kill him. But, you know, but. At the same time, God said it's not going to happen. I don't care what the circums look like, circumstances look like. God said it's not going to happen. And th this was a, this, was this a hard test? 
You got, you got his brother that says, next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. He's coming with 400, guy, 400 guys, and God's saying, so what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I'm going to send a bunch of people ahead of me and a bunch of animals and stuff, and I'm going to try to feed him, because that seems like a pretty good idea to me. It wasn't a bad idea, but it actually wasn't even necessary either. Really, all they needed to do was to just surrender and then trust God. And that's all we really need to do as well. There's so many things that we face in this life. And this is, the, this is the normal Christian experience here. We surrender and our sins are forgiven. We walk with the Lord. And then we hit hard things, tough things. We find ourselves in fear, distress. Get along with God. Talk it through with God. Surrender it to God. It's not an easy thing, is it? But it's what we need to do if we're going to be called Christians and have his name upon us. And you know what? The great thing, as I mentioned earlier, is that it, it would be a little distressing if uh, Abraham had his hip pulled out and Isaac had his arm pulled off. And, you know, but all these guys don't, don't go through this. It's kind of a uniquely Jacob uh, thing. Tough guy. Knuckleheaded kind of a guy. You know, I mean, he's had to go through a lot to really reach this point to really be able to surrender and, and trust God. Uh, I don't know if you're a knucklehead. I mean, I was. It took a lot for me to finally just surrender. And, it, and it's a continuing process. But we're going to get to guys like Joseph. He never goes through this. I mean, he has bad stuff happen to him. His brothers hate his guts. They betray him. They throw him in a pit, sell him into slavery into Egypt, go back, tell the father that, yeah, probably eaten by lions and bears, and he's... He's dead. Here's some blood on his garment. So, sorry, Dad, you're giving more in for the next 40 years, but uh, we'll hope you get over it in time. And, uh, and you know the rest of the story of, of Joseph. God never, he never wrestles with God through the night and have his, uh, his uh, hip pulled out of joint. He just kind of, well, well okay. I, I think he kind of, I don't think he was real thrilled about being in the pit, going into slavery and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, we, he rises above all that stuff. And, uh, it's what makes it such a great study. All I want to say is that you don't have to go to the point where, where God does something uh, really drastic to get your attention and pin you into a corner so that you can learn to trust him. You can just learn to trust him. That's why we study his word, so we can learn about his character and go, man, I can really trust God. You can look back on the things he's done for you already and go, I, I can really trust the Lord with this because he wants to change us to make us more like him. He wants to, that was the idea, I'm giving you a new name, new identity, new character. It's not who you were before, Jacob. You're gonna go on, people are gonna know you completely different from who you were before. That's what God wants for each of us as well. Amen.